Patch Patch. Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and today we are presenting to you audio that had to be cut from last week's episode covering House Tully, in particular, the Lord of River Run, as we begin a song of ice and fire, Lord Hoster Tully, his brother, Brendan Tully, the Blackfish, and all of the stuff preceding a Game of Thrones. This covers material not exactly vital to our main subject, Catelyn Tully, Catelyn Stark, the Lady in Winterfell. This is not so much directly related to her, but it is somewhat fascinating as it covers the proposed marriage alliance between Hoster Tully and Tywin Lannister, in which Jaime Lannister, at the time Lord Tywin's heir, being his firstborn son, would have been married to Lysa Tully, Lord Hoster's second-born daughter. This marriage alliance, I don't believe, is ever really given the discussion or the analysis that it needs. This marriage alliance is glossed over and I don't think ever really taken seriously by the characters involved, the author, George R. R. Martin, or the readers. It's dismissed, frankly, and we're going to take a look at it. It's interesting, fascinating, and honestly, it's downright bizarre that this alliance was even considered in the first place, let alone discussed, negotiated, and a cat's hair away from being a done deal. In addition, we muse on Hoster Tully and Brendan Tully and Catelyn Tully and the relationship between the three. Enjoy. We will be back with part three of Hook, Line, and Sinker, or, if you will, part one of our look at Catelyn Stark's narrative through A Song of Ice and Fire. We're getting into it. John versus Catelyn, round three. Enjoy. Do you think that Hoster would have urged Brynden to give up his rights to River Run, thus making Catelyn his only heir if he never had a son? Like, if Edmure had not been born, do you think that Hoster would have allowed Brynden to be his heir, or do you think he, he would have made a, a play for Catelyn to be his heir? I think you need a little more evidence one way or the other, I think. I don't know. It's, it's, okay, well, do you think Catelyn, if, if Catelyn was in Hoster's shoes, do you think she would have? H- Hoster would definitely put Sansa in there over, you know, uh, <laughs> over an uncle. Yeah. Uh, Lysa does seem like she was a little bit dim-witted as a child, right? Uh, by the time Edmure was old enough to comprehend she's what his- definitely seems dim-witted as an adult. <laughs> yeah, dude, extra dim-witted as an adult. Well, crazy, just fucking yeah. bad shit crazy as an adult. Um, By the time Edmure was old enough to comprehend what his father might have tried to teach him about ruling, which in Edmure's case probably would have been like when he was like 21 or 22. (laughs) By that time, Peter Baelish was around and he was treated uh, like one of the Tully children. So I'm sure Hoster spent enough time with Edmure, but it is doubtful that it came anywhere close to the attention Catelyn got. He probably would have needed to go to a ward for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Because Hoster wasn't around. It was so infrequent that Hoster was around. The death of Lady Manissa, another son, doesn't seem to have rocked Hoster Tully's psyche the way it seems like it would have, based on everything we already talked about. Basically, if he had so much love for Lady Manissa, if he had already dealt with the death of two infants, like I feel like her death and another son's death, it would have fucking drove him mad. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't seem like he goes mad, though, or anything. No, it doesn't. Catelyn keeps saying that he loved her, he loved her, but he's just, you know, eh, whatever. She's dead, son's dead, gonna go travel a little bit. It is hard to argue that the death of Lady Minissa put great responsibility on Catelyn Tully. So she's the oldest of the Tully children. According to her, her father's favorite child. She's the de facto leader of her siblings and foster brother, treated by her father as though she were his heir. So Catelyn's mother's death it now means that she also has to function as the Lady of River Run, and this at the age of 10 or 11 or 12. So it's safe to assume the following about Catelyn Tully pre A Song of Ice and Fire. She was likely giving 
far more attention than her younger siblings because she is the firstborn and because the two children born before her died. She was treated by her father, one of the great lords of Westeros and ruler of basically everyone that Catelyn ever met. She was treated as a firstborn son and heir for quite a few years. She didn't, she did not learn enough about the responsibilities of a noble woman from her mother. Her mother was with child thrice more in the years that Catelyn knew her and was also sickly. We talked about Lady Minissa likely being from a cadet branch of House Went, so it's possible that Lady Minissa didn't even know about the responsibilities of noble women of great houses. Catelyn had a lot of responsibility forced on her early on. She experienced all of these things before the age of 12, and then at age 12, she is betrothed to the heir to Winterfell, Brandon Stark. And Brandon will one day be the Warden of the North. He will rule over a land greater in size than the rest of Westeros put together. Mm -hmm. So despite her position as the Lady of River Run, this marriage will give her more power and put her in a more prominent place. And it's also important to note, obviously, that this alliance seems like it was very important to her father, who she is well aware has had a great many disappointments and looks more to her for support than anyone else. Obviously, the alliance also ends up being vital in the shaping of the realm as we head into the turn of the century, but not in the same way as it was initially designed by Hasser Tully and Rickard Stark. And there wasn't much to find as far as the details of the Stark Tully marriage alliance. We infer them from the Southern ambitions and from the tourney at Iron Hall. We can take a guess, but we don't know for sure why this came about and why it worked so well. Maybe this is what I texted you about. As interesting as it is, and as. Oh, okay. I, I think you know you're going with this. Yeah. Basically, after securing a marriage for Catelyn with House Stark, Hoster immediately gets to work securing the same such marriage for his second daughter, Lysa. So this is when Catelyn is 12, Lysa will be 10 or 11. Um, she hasn't been pregnant yet from Baelish. She's not damaged goods yet. He begins negotiations with Lord Tywin Lannister, Lord of Castle Rock, Warden of the West, hand to the king to marry his youngest daughter to Tywin's heir, Jaime Lannister. So it's canon that Tywin seemed on board with this alliance. Very shockingly. Yeah, it's it's pretty fucking crazy, bro, if you think about it. Because just knowing Tywin, it's like, why the fuck would he do that? So Jamie is, uh, he was sent by Lord Sumner Craycall. So uh, Jamie served as squire to Lord Craycall. And Lord Craycall sends him to River Run with a message for Lord Hoster. And Lord Hoster takes a fortnight to reply to Lord Craycall's message. And every night, Jamie sat next to Lysa for dinner. But Jamie showed Little to no interest whatsoever in Lysa. Mm -hmm. Didn't even look at her. He was enamored with her uncle, Sir Brendan. Yes. And Jamie would ask the Blackfish nightly about his experiences, deeds on the battlefield, specifically his time fighting in the War of the Nine Penny Kings. So Jamie Lannister, at this point, age 13, it seems like he's clearly more cut out for fighting on the battlefield than holding court, which you find out to be true later on. Despite the disinterest on Jamie's part, Tywin invites Hoster to King's Landing in 281 AC to discuss a bride's dower. So they were that close to a marriage pact where they're talking mm -hmm. about, the, you know, the bride's dower where Hoster's like, I'll, you know, I'll give you fucking a mill and all this gold if your son marries my daughter. Before the marriage was finalized, the betrothal was ended by King Ares Targaryen. Ares the Mad names wow. Jamie Lannister to his king's guard. Oh, well, that's right. That's, yes. In taking the oath and the White Cloak, Jamie gives up any claim to Castle Rock, gives up any option to marry, father children, told any land whatsoever. Essentially, Jamie's life would be in the service of defending Arya's life. Tywin suggests his younger son Tyrion as a replacement in the pack. <laughs> and Hoster says he wants a whole man for Lysa, alluding to Tyrion being a dwarf. I found this proposed, nearly agreed upon, nearly done deal between Hoster Tully and Tywin Lannister pretty interesting. Almost signed Tilla delivered. Look at it from Hoster's point of view, it's like a no-brainer. His oldest daughter is betrothed to the future Warden of the North, Lord of Winterfell. War of the West, here we come. Well, I mean, dude, it could be argued that Tywin Lannister's heir is a step up from the marriage he found for Catelyn, right? Almost, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I love Jaime Lannister. I love him since, like, the Storm of Swords, but that doesn't make me, like, a Lannister man. Like, I'm still a Stark man. But I look at the two possible marriages, and Lysa's marriage to the heir of Casterly Rock, Warden of the West, Son of the Hand to the King, Seems like it's more lucrative, uh, and it would put her in a far more powerful position than Catelyn's marriage to Brandon Stark. <laughs> Daddy, I need to be freaking wet to Rhaegar. <laughs> yeah. We gotta one-up that. This is where it's weird, because I get the advantage from Hoster's 
side, but from Tywin, I don't see any advantage at all. We know Tywin Lannister well enough to know that if there is an advantage for him in marrying his heir to the fat, dim-witted second daughter of Hastur Tully, easily a lesser house than his own, there must be an advantage. Otherwise, he wouldn't do it. So what could the advantage... Um, why would Tywin Lannister seek out this alliance? And I, I can't come up with an answer. I was just brainstorming. There's the rumors of Jamie and Cersei being caught together as children. Punishment, maybe? Yeah, like maybe Tywin wished to marry Jamie off as soon as possible to prevent a repeat of that behavior. Maybe. But Tywin does seem like he's more patient than that. And he would wait for the perfect marriage opportunity. Maybe his real focus was marrying Cersei to Prince Rhaegar. But if anybody can multitask, it's Tywin Lannister. And he's the hand of the king. So he has advantage in all negotiations, basically, because he's ruling the realm. Maybe he's into it because the bride's dower would be huge, but that's not likely because the Lannisters are like fucking wealthiest family in Westeros. Definitely before War of the Five Kings, they're the wealthiest. And I'm sure Tywin's always looking to increase House Lannister's wealth, but there's got to be a better way to do it than marrying his heir to fucking Lysa Tully. Then there's the War of the Nine Penny Kings, friendship, Southern ambitions. How deep was Tywin into that? And we can't really know the extent. Tywin was involved in forming a, an alliance of great houses to keep Targaryen rule in check. He was the hand to the Targaryen ruler, so it's unlikely that he would need an alliance of great houses to keep Ares in check, because he was Ares' hand. So I don't know if that's necessarily part of it. Maybe he was doing it to leverage a pact with House Tully into achieving a better pact with a better house. And I'd maybe say that's the most likely reason, but there's nothing to indicate that there was any other negotiations for marriage for Jamie. Other than, I don't know if you remember the story Oberyn Martell tells Tyrion when we first meet Oberyn in the Storm of Swords. He tells Tyrion about him and his sister Ilya traveling through the realm, visiting noble houses to investigate possible marriage betrothals. Mm -hmm. And the Red Viper tells Tyrion about their final visit to Casterly Rock, thus implying that there was consideration of a Lannister Martell pact with Oberyn to marry Cersei or Ilya to marry Jaime or both. And I was thinking, maybe that's it. But that's not possible either. Tywin was not receptive to the idea. He said that Cersei was meant for Prince Rhaegar, and Lady Johanna had died in childbirth shortly before the arrival of the Martells at Casterly Rock. So this would make the Martells visit 273 AC, eight years before the negotiations with River Run and Hastur Tully anyway. So it's, it's impossible. Maybe there's no ulterior motive to the negotiations. Jamie is the heir at Casterly Rock, title of Warden of the West, Regardless of who he marries, marrying the second daughter of a great house likely makes House Lannister stronger than marrying the first daughter of their wealthiest and most powerful Bannerman house, right? So maybe he thinks Jamie marrying Lysa is better than Jamie marrying fucking, you know, House Marbrand's first daughter. Right. And maybe Tywin saw the writing on the wall in regards to Ares too. He knew conflict was coming. Perhaps Tywin meant to use a marriage pact with the Great House as leverage to get Ares to accept a marriage for Rhaegar to Cersei. Any of that's possible. Uh, that, that's, the, way, the way you just said right there, I think, is maybe the most possible one, maybe, I can think of. You know, made a son for, look, I'm going to get my son to marry, you know, yeah. this one over here. So maybe you might want to consider, you know, marrying my daughter Rhaegar. Yeah. It makes the most sense. Honestly, of all these, it makes the most sense. The thing that makes the most sense after this is kind of scary. And that would be George R. R. Martin just picked a name out of a fucking hat to move the narrative along. Wow, well, that's actually option number two, I think. <laughs> yeah, there's no thought it put into it whatsoever. But it's 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 interesting because you see the allure from Hasta Tully. It's like, all right, you know, I got this alliance with the stars. It's like, oh shit, now I got this possible alliance for fucking Lysa <laughs> with the with the Lannisters. And there's gotta be like a there's gotta be like a hundred better matches for Jamie than Lysa Tully. Right. Especially a guy like Jamie who's a good looking guy. I mean, Lysa was never really known to be you know No. Frumpy and Catelyn, like, yeah. okay, Catelyn was yeah, and people said Catelyn was beautiful. Not on the inside. <laughs> Horrible on the inside. So I don't know, man. I think I think that's probably it. It was probably had to do with leveraging probably had to do with a combination of the rumors about Jamie and Cersei. Having Jamie married off so he could just focus on Cersei marrying Rhaegar 
And you know what? Cersei marries Rhaegar, Jaime marries Lysa, House Lannister is more powerful. And if anybody knows how to take advantage of a vacuum in leadership, it's Tywin Lannister. And I'm sure he could parlay that marriage pact into a better spot for House Lannister. But at the end of the day, it doesn't seem like there's a clear cut reason why he did it. So yeah, maybe it's just George Martin picking a name out of a hat. Thanks for listening. You can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash The Promise Princes. Follow us on Twitter at Princes Promise. Find us on Tumblr also, Instagram. Read the Westerosi Companion, the princes that were promised.com. Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, Stitcher, SoundCloud. We're on YouTube now. You can listen to our podcasts. Leave a review, subscribe, tell a friend about the princes that were promised. Thank you for listening, and we will speak with you guys later. Bum, 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 bum,